and he is the head of adaptive oncology at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. And he's going to be talking us, to us about how open source has changed the world. Most of you have probably at least heard of Lincoln. He's a pillar of the bioinformatics community. He was awarded the Ben Franklin Award for Open Access in Bioinformatics in 2004. He was named an ISCB Fellow and one of the world's most influential scientific minds. And the list of projects he's led includes some of the greatest hits of bioinformatics. And finally, it's um, my personal pleasure to welcome Lincoln back to do another keynote 20 years after his keynote at our very first BOSC in 2000. So over to you, Lincoln. Thank you very much, Nomi. Uh, so I have a this terrible history of creating these really grandiose sounding titles and then failing to deliver. So I decided uh, that this time I was going to uh, have a, a, a change the title at the last at the last minute to something a little bit more modest. So um, I have never used the sharing function. Can you just tell me whether you can see my screen? Hello. Oh, okay. All right. Can you? Can everyone see my screen? I'm assuming so. I'm not hearing anything. Okay. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, how to accelerate the process of sharing a human biomedical uh, data research um, in, uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, human patients. And I'm going to put it in the context of flattening the curve. So we're going to go back to March 16th of 2020 which was the first day that uh, the city of Toronto entered its COVID-related lockdown. This is the front page from the uh, Toronto Star um, uh, on, that, on that day. And kind of amazingly, just uh, 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 about a week later, uh, this website appeared called flatten.ca, which was a COVID-19 information portal. Remember, this was a time when there really was no information uh, uh, about who was getting COVID-19, what the risk factors were. The Public Health Agency of Ontario was completely overwhelmed, didn't know what to do. Uh, and yet this, this, uh, this site suddenly appeared. Uh, and what it did was to, uh, it was a patient-initiated ini research portal. Uh, anybody could log into this and they would enter their symptoms, whether they had a cough, whether they had a fever, uh, family history information, demographic information, and very importantly, uh, their, their, the first three characters of their postal code, which uh, gives you a, uh, a region that's several city blocks in size, a few hundred uh, families. Um, and uh, there was also ways to enter COVID-19 testing results. And then this data was collected and put onto an interactive heat map so you could look to see, you know, where there were clusters of cases or people that had suspicious symptoms. So darker areas here indicated clusters of people with symptoms and risk factors. And for the man on the street, you could ask, well, how is my neighborhood doing? Is there a lot of COVID or COVID-related symptoms here? Health officials could look at this and say, well, what areas are there suspicious clusters of people with symptoms that may have latent outbreaks? Um, and uh, lastly, uh, uh, the data was uh, uh, available to researchers to develop predictive models. What symptoms and risk factors predict that there will be an epidemic here, an outbreak here uh, in a week, in a one to two weeks? Uh, they also put up a very nice interactive dashboard where they're showing aggregated data uh, from multiple public, um, uh, multiple public sites. I'm just making sure that there's no, nobody's chatting to me to tell me you can't see my slides. Okay, very good. 
Okay, uh, this whole system was built mostly from open source components. It uses the React JavaScript library, it uses the Webpack Asset Bundler, a bunch of libraries from uh, Google's open source uh, web development toolkit, Carto base maps for the heat map, open street maps data. The only um, uh, library that I found that I don't think is open source is they're using the, the paper forms, forms library. But other than that, it was completely an open source uh, system. And this site really went viral in incredibly quickly. It had, in its very first week, 300,000 respondents within Canada. It received national media attention from multiple regional and national newspapers. Uh, it quickly got support from the Google Cloud, from the Vector Institute for uh, Artificial Intelligence. Uh, a series of funding agent and a series of funding agencies in Canada. The whole city of Montreal took the platform, mirrored it, and adopted it as its COVID-19 surveillance system, and was also adopted by an international aid group to support a public health effort in, so in Somalia. So who are the people behind this amazing website? Well, it was surprisingly not bioinformaticians, not public health experts, not senior software engineers or AI people. It was a first year engineering student at the University of Toronto named Trey Jane and a number of volunteers and friends, all undergraduates from universities of Toronto, Waterloo and Hamilton. It started out with about six people at the beginning and it grows through to 30 in July and the site is still going strong. And this is an open source success story. It went up in a week. It was immediately useful in confronting a health crisis. Since then, there have been multiple well-funded efforts to create a site like this, um, but really neither uh, Canada's federal or provincial agencies uh, have really caught up with the, the elegance and simplicity of this system. And to be honest, I was completely green with envy because during that first week of COVID-19, I had started working on a grant application to create something very similar to this. And by the time I submitted the application, flatten.ca had gone up and it was no longer necessary. So, so how did a handful of engineering undergrads achieve what uh, professional bioinformaticians uh, were not able to? So let's compare the, uh, uh, let's look at what it takes in the academic world to create uh, a data sharing portal like this. So let's say you're really good and you could write a grant in a week. So then it'll, and then you submit it for peer review and an, under ordinary circumstances, it'll take nine months for review and funding. In the weeks uh, of the COVID-19 outbreak, there were um, uh, various funding agencies announced accelerated COVID-19 related grants that would take about six weeks for approval. Then the real problem was, was that because you're dealing with personal health information from humans, um, and I really envy the people who are still working or working in the model organism world here, you have to go through ethics board reviews. Um, one for each institution that uh, you and your collaborators belong to. And each of these can take uh, eight or 12 weeks. So that's another two to three months uh, of delay. And then finally, for something like this, maybe one to two weeks of implementation. So let's say you could skip the, uh, the grant, uh, the, uh, the funding part, and just use other sources of funding or institutional funding for this. You'd still come up with this big bottleneck on the ethics board reviews. And uh, I don't want to knock the importance of, of institutional review boards. I think they're very important at protecting patients. Um, uh, but I do want to note that flatten.ca um, may not have, probably would not have uh, survived its, its ethics review. Uh, if you go to the flatten.ca site, uh, even now, um, there is a um, uh, uh, there is a statement that says, if you are concerned about using this site, please check our terms of service. And when you check the terms of service, there's a paragraph that says, you acknowledge that all information you provide to us will be made available publicly through our website and our heat maps in an effort to help healthcare providers, researchers, and others in their efforts to fight COVID-19. And if you do not like these terms, don't use, don't use the platform, but we'd like to hear from you anyway. Uh, and this is, uh, this is really kind of problematic. It's not something that an IRB would allow through. 
first of all, there's implicit acceptance of the terms of use. If you go to the site, you do not have a click-through agreement. You actually have to actively seek out the terms of use link and click on it. The informed consent there is really inadequate. It doesn't say exactly who will be using participants' personal health data. It says researchers, physicians, and others. What purposes can the data be used for? It doesn't answer that. What are the potential harms, if any? How long will the data be retained? Who owns the data? Do so the participant have the right to withdraw the data? There are a whole series of checklist things that have to go that IRBs look at to make sure that the patient is has informed consent and understands the risks and benefits and has agreed. Uh, there's no obvious right of redress if your data is misused. They don't really publish a cybersecurity policy. Um, they say that they're, they're going to make a good faith effort to avoid redistributing record level data, but um, is that really sufficient? And finally, is collection of three digit postal code geolocation data sufficient to protect the identity of participants? In fact, in a city, there may be a, a, a thousand people with the same three digit postal code, but in remote parts of Canada, rural, Canada and rural areas, um, that, that may only be uh, a few dozens of people. And, and then finally, it really isn't clear from flatten.ca whether the, uh, the data really is available for research. Uh, when you go to the site, they, their main way, the only way they, they have of distributing the survey results is this heat map. There's no link anywhere to download the data or to contact people to get to get the data, so it 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 really isn't it really isn't clear how the data is being how the data is being used, who is who it is available to, and if you're a researcher, how in fact do you get this data to build the predictive models of COVID nineteen infection that the site was designed to answer? So, I, I, the on the other hand. You know, public health data has a different has a different tradition, and uh, you know, in many cases, they don't ask for informed consent. This is actually a different site. This is the Ontario Public Data Catalog from the Ontario government, and they actually publish all their COVID nineteen testing results in a big spreadsheet that you can access. Uh, and as you can see, it lists each individual the date they were tested, where they live, uh, and it even their, their sex and, and uh, age range, and it even has longitude and latitude information and six-letter postal codes, which is down to a uh, the east or west side of a street. So I don't want to, um, uh, I don't want to criticize flatten.ca for being too free with patient data. In fact, they're much less free with patient data than the uh, than uh, public health um, Ontario public health is. So the rest of the talk, I'm gonna I gotta talk about how can we achieve what Flatten D, Flatten CA did or tried to do in a responsible, fast and effective fashion, creating aggregated patient data sets and distributing them in a frictionless way to the community for secondary research. So I just want to start out by pointing out that multiple uh, surveys of patients' attitudes towards participating in biomedical research show a very positive, show that patients by and large are overwhelmingly in favor of sharing their personal health information. Here's a 2016 study from the British Medical Journal, and it showed that more than 80% of the patients that they surveyed had a positive attitude towards participating in a clinical trial, 10% had no opinion, and only 10% had, had a negative attitude. 84% of, the, uh, of the ones who had a positive attitude said that making data from a clinical trial was very important or important to them. So they wanted to publicize their data. And 63% said that if the investigator failed to make the data public, that would make them less likely to participate. So there's a very strong prior for patients to participate in clinical trials 
uh, for their data to be collected and for that data to be shared widely with other with the research community. So I was thinking about how to do this. This is yesterday. I happened to go to with my family to the uh, on to an Ontario farmers market. You can see people are masked up here and trying to social distance as well as they can. Um, and I ran into this guy. Uh, name is Seth. And he is a he runs a company called Forbes Wild Foods, and he and his staff are foragers. They go out into the Ontario North Woods. They gather mushrooms and barks and berries and leaves. They package them uh, and syrups and so on. They package them nicely uh, and they sell them at the farmers market and and at, uh, um, uh, and at organic stores um, to consumers. And there's a great deal of knowledge that goes into foraging effectively. You have to know where the plants grow, when, they, when they're out, which ones are poisonous and which ones are good for you, uh, how to combine them, how to gather and store them, and so on. And it reminded me very much about what the sort of thing that I and my colleagues do. We're data foragers. We look at the literature. We see a paper come out. We try to find out where that data set is. We try to evaluate whether it's a good data set or it's, it's a poisonous data set. And then we try to we integrate them, put them out into portals, and try to make them palatable and accessible to the community. Now, foraging is a very labor-intensive and non-scalable task. How do we go from a foraging model to a farm-to-table model, where there's a group of uh, researchers who design the study, harvest the data in a systematic way, publish it in a well-defined series of data archives, and then uh, a, a secondary group of, of bioinformaticians serves the data out to the ultimate consumers of the data. So how, what do we need to do to go from a forager model to a farm to table model? And so in this talk, I'm gonna talk about six different mechanisms to do this. So one is at the entry point for data to make the IRB, the Institutional Review Board process, faster and more efficient and more effective. Second, how do we, uh, how do we take the guesswork out of patient consent forms and turn them into something standardized and predictable? How do we third, how do we share data sets on the cloud to make them findable using data set registries and search services? Fourth, how do we use standardized metadata to describe omics data and other common data types so that they can be findable in a, in a standardized and predictive way? Uh, and then when it comes time to for researchers to access the data, how do we use standardized data usage agreements that are machine readable uh, in order to uh, decide if a researcher's proposed use of the data is consistent with the patient consent and the study design. And finally, I'm gonna talk very briefly about a registered data access system that allows responsible researchers uh, carte blanche to access a subset of, of, um, of data sets. So the current uh, institutional review board process for collaborative projects is, it was designed in the 20th century and it's really, really clunky and slow. So most research projects, most big research projects these days have multiple investigators from different institutions. Each of them has to go through his own institution, uh, his own institution's IRB. So there's typically a full review uh, that takes between, that takes weeks to months uh, at the principal investigator's institution. Uh, and then if it's approved, there is a shorter process called an administrative review at each of the collaborators' institutions. And those may take, those are not done by the full board. They're usually a two to four week process uh, 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 by a subset of the board. And after this goes through, and so you'll, add, you'll end up adding another month or two to this, the project can get started. This is ignoring data transfer agreements and material transfer agreements and, so, and contracts and so forth. But at a minimum, minimum, you're looking at three to four months before a project that collects hu and shares human data can actually get can actually get started. 
Um, there are multiple ways that this can be uh, this can be improved. The big bottlenecks are that, first of all, IRB panelists are volunteers who have their own labs. Uh, they're performing service, service work. They have limited time. Full IRBs may not meet for once a month or once every other month. Uh, each, each researcher has to obtain an IRB approval from his or her respective institution. Every, every IRB has a different set of protocols for application and reviewing. And each application must be reviewed by hand. And the most time consuming process of this is reviewing the consent material to ensure uh, patient, fully informed patient consent. And although the administrative reviews uh, do help speed up this process, they still generate extensive paperwork uh, and SAP time, both in preparation and in review. So one, uh, you know, so one uh, way of, uh, of speeding this up is to uh, de-emphasize the individual institution's IRBs and instead set up a series of large central, centralized regional IRBs where the principal investigator at institution A and all the co-applicants at their institutions submit a single application to the regional IRB which then reviews the entire uh, the entire uh, application um, and uh, issues an approval that is valid for all institutions. And the individual IRBs um, uh, allow for dele have delegated their responsibility. They will accept the regional IRB's decision. And the big advantage of this is that if you then go to add a new center to a previously approved study, you bring on a new collaborator, you, they also benefit. There's not a second IRB uh, approval process. There's just a quick amendment that, may, that takes a couple of days to add them in, to register them. And so here's a real world example of that working. Um, my institution, the Ontario uh, Institute for Cancer Research, has sponsored for the past decade uh, a entity called OCREB, the Ontario Cancer Research Ethics Board. Uh, it's been granted um, authority by the province to approve multi-center cancer clinical trials throughout Ontario. Any Ontario cancer clinical trial is eligible for review by the OCREB. They do a 10-week turnaround uh, on new multi-center trials uh, requiring full board approval. And then when new centers are added to a previously approved trial, it's a two to three day turnaround. There's also a pilot project underway to allow for reciprocal approval with uh, a, a similar entity in, Man in Manitoba, which then would allow multi-center trials to be uh, conducted in Manitoba and Ontario under a single, under single umbrella. There's no reason this couldn't be expanded to, uh, all, to all, all of Canada, provided that the patient privacy protection laws are consistent from one, uh, one uh, province to the, to the next. Um, the 10 weeks, however, is still uh, a long time. And if you look at what's taking that 10 weeks, a lot of it is reading the consents uh, and, try, um, um, and, going, uh, and, and going through them in detail. And the challenges are that currently, each consent is a uh, is a thing unto itself. It's created uh, ad in an ad hoc way, and it has different non-standardized language. And the things that the uh, uh, that uh, IRBs look for are: who will the data be shared for? Uh, is it both? Uh, is it uh, are there for-profit entities involved? Was a patient informed of that? What purposes will the data be used for? What what are its allowable uses? How will the personally identifiable data be managed and protected? What are the potential harms? How is the consent process managed to ensure that the participants understands the choice? And uh, the, uh, the fact that each consent is different makes their work really hard. So the things that can be done to make this easier is first of all, to adopt standardized consent language that makes it easier to evaluate a study and determine the, share, the data sharing terms in an unambiguous way. And even better would it be to add a machine readable consent ontology uh, where 
um, a uh, you can have a machine algorithm which matches up the intended use to of the da of a data set to the patient consent. And the analogy I'd like to draw here is open source licenses. If we remember, go back 10 years or 15 years, there was a proliferation of, uh, of open source licenses and, and groups claiming that they were developing open source software. But in fact, each license was different and allowed you to do different things and had to be examined individually. Then the Creative Commons came along and they standardized open source licenses and grouped them into a well understood series of tiers. Uh, and that has greatly cleaned up the ability to take open source tools and combine them and create derivative works. So there is a, uh, there's already a well-established effort um, spearheaded by a number of, uh, uh, spearheaded by individual IRBs as well as by international consortia to create standardized patient consent te templates. Here are just two examples. One is from OCREB, the other is from the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. And so, for example, they are templates which uh, I'll give you a multiple choice. You can choose, for this part of the consent, you choose clause one or clause two or clause, or clause three, and they provide guidance on which, one, which ones to use. Okay, so we'll get, and uh, these in large part can be supplemented by the data, by a ontology of data usage, which I will talk, to, talk about uh, a little bit later in the in this talk. Okay, so once the page, once the study has started and you're collecting data, you need to share it. And where do you share it to? Well, there are a series of archives that we're all very well uh, aware of, such as uh, and the and NCBI and EGA and uh, um, uh, the Elixir uh, Elixir archives, where people can store genomic and phenotypic data. However, as we're all very aware, uh, the volume of these data have really made it um, uh, impractical and, un and financially infeasible to download the data set to do secondary research. Nowadays, the data are being copied and mirrored into clouds of various sorts. And the problem is that there's not one size fits all cloud Everybody has their favorite cloud. Each one offers different advantages and disadvantages. Uh, and the data sets end up being scattered among multiple clouds. And sometimes, in fact, they are mirrored. The same data set is mirrored between two clouds. And how do you get at that data? So let's say this is your favorite, this is your favorite uh, 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 cloud. Maybe you're lucky and you have, uh, a, and one of the data sets is already in the cloud, so you just access it there. But in another case, but maybe you want to combine it with this data set, which is not natively there. There needs to be a transparent way of bringing it into that cloud so that you can combine the data sets to do your analysis. So one of the innovations that I'd like to plug here is a global alliance for genomics and health service called the Data Repository Service. And this is a service, uh, a, a recently published standard, which assigns unique, unambiguous IDs to data sets, such that they can be placed into a cloud and you can uh, request them, you can uh, find them, request them, and transfer them into your cloud in a well-defined way. It consists of a URI, URI scheme for describing biological data sets. There are actually two versions of this scheme. One contains a, uh, the host name of where the data set is, plus a unique ID for the, uh, for the data set. And the other is a, uh, um, is a host name independent version where there is a, uh, where you have to pass this URI to a resolver service and that returns the, uh, the host uh, URIs that you can download from. And then there's a whole API that goes along with this to control authorization, to get checksums and metadata from the object, to get the data, and to register and resolve the URIs. This has already been implemented at multiple sites. And if you are putting together a, 
um, a, a data repository of your own, I strongly encourage you to implement this API to make it easier for your users to identify these data sets unambiguously. Now, along with an ID, you need a search and retrieval system. You'd like to be able, you'd like, uh, as a user of this data, I'd like to be able to ask what data sets have donors that have BRCA1 germline mutations are, and are been made available for cancer-related research. I'd like to be able to go to a server, um, pose this question, and have a check, find the data sets that satisfy the requirement, and then send me a data set manifest that contains all these DRS IDs, and then I can go into the cloud of my choice and pull them into, pull them into the cloud so I can do the analysis. So there is a Global Alliance uh, working group that's working on, dis on discovery. Um, so far, it's published a, uh, an API called the Beacon System, which allows for very simple queries such as, does your data set have any donors that have a BRCA1 mutation? And if the answer is yes, it'll give you a contact email address for you to uh, ask for access to that data set. That really isn't what we want, but it was the first step. And the second step of doing this, these arbitrary searches, it's still a work, it's still a work in progress. There is no stable API um, that uh, I, ca I can recommend that you use. However, in the interim, there is a very mature piece of data that was, pub that was uh, developed by my colleagues, Vincent Ferretti and Christina, Yang, Christina Young uh, at OICR um, called Overture, which does provide registration data transfer, metadata management, and search and retrieval, uh, uh, retrieval services. So what it consists of is, uh, uh, is uh, multiple parts. So let's say you're a data provider and you have a, uh, a, a, pay, some, uh, a patient data set and you have metadata, including say phenotypic uh, clinical data uh, and genomic data in BAM or VCF files, these are all arbitrary formats. So Overture provides a service called Song, um, which tracks metadata. You can register the data set in Song, um, and then uh, using a, another piece of software called SCORE, transfer the underlying uh, genomic uh, 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 molecular data into a series of clouds provides a very fast and reliable um, data transfer service, and Song will track where these data sets are so that when you deposit it into a cloud, Song will know. When you mirror it in, from one cloud to another or move it from one cloud to another, Song will track where the data set currently is. And then Song provides a search service which can be used with another component of Overture called the Arranger, which allows you to create compelling interactive search and retrieval portals. And the final component of Overture is a system called Ego, which manages authentication and authorization using a variety of well-known um, uh, um, user ID methods, including Google IDs, Facebook IDs, and GitHub uh, IDs, as well as others. It's extensible. The system has been implemented at multiple sites, um, uh, holding tens of thousands of data uh, of uh, uh, donor data sets, including the Kids First Data Resource Center and an IH project, which tracks 14,000 donors uh, uh, with their clinical and genomic data who have pediatric cancer or structural birth defects. It's integrated with a series of clouds, allows for data searching and visualization, and it allows you to uh, uh, create virtual cohorts by asking, I want children who have, find me all children who have a limb abnormalities and who have a germline mutation in gene A. And you can create a cohort there to, to do further studies with. It's used by the uh, International Cancer Genome Consortium's data portal that has 22,000 donors and 80 million somatic mutations. That's integrated with Amazon S3 and a uh, cloud called the Cancer Genome Collaboratory, uh, which is uh, uh, run by my lab in Ontario. Um, 
It's used, it underlies the uh, data portal for the genomic data commons at the NCI, which is 33,000 cancer patients in TCJ Target and Foundation Medicine. And it's also used in the Human Cancer Models Initiative by NCI, which is a repository of uh, cancer models, such as organoids and cell lines. And it provides a shopping experience, uh, kind of s modeled after the uh, uh, after uh, Best Buy and Amazon. Uh, just to give, give you an idea of the flexibility of uh, of uh, Overture and the Arranger, this is what the kids first um, uh, site looks like. It has an expanding series of filters that allow you to check off what you're looking for. It's similar to shopping for printers at Best Buy. I think that's the best analogy. It, it generates a, uh, a, a list of data sets and donors that match the criteria, and then you can download them, export the metadata to CSV, or you can hit um, this button, which brings you into uh, the Kavatica analysis cloud and imports the data and allows you to perform uh, analysis on this. And there's also an underlying command line API, so you can do all these things from, the, from, uh, from a script that you've written within the cloud. Here's the same software, but it's been rebranded for use in the Human Cancer Models Initiative. Here, it's demonstrating that there's interactive visualizations showing you the distribution of the data sets you've identified. And there's also a, uh, uh, a, a visual query a uh, system that you can edit or copy or share or import to your import into your scripts which will capture the filters that you applied uh, interactively okay so the last topic i'm going to talk about is um, uh, is getting data access um, uh, for for research use and, and and the problem is this that Every human data set um, has a, uh, a data access committee associated with it, which is responsible for reviewing applications to, uh, uh, to access, download, and use the data. Um, that, the way these work, in case you've not worked with these before, is you write up a proposal saying what you're going to use the data for. Um, you compare it and you compare it against the data set's data use statement, and the DAC then uh, reviews what the restrictions on the data are, what you're proposing to do, and tries to decide if you're allowed to do what you're asking for. And it's really challenging uh, for the DAC, and it's frustrating for researchers, and it may take months for an approval to be reviewed. And it's particularly problematic when the proposed analysis requires integrating data, multiple data sets that have different data use statements. And like the consents, the problem here is that data use restrictions are, are again, done at ad hoc as free text. Now, here's the front page of dbGaP, uh, an NCI repository of human studies, uh, circa 2015. Um, it's improved since then, but not all that much. Um, and it just shows, uh, just to, to, to illustrate the, the differences in the in data restrictions. So this first one is uh, allowed for general research use. Whatever you want to do with the data, um, as long as it's in the interest of science, you're allowed to do it. This one, however, is more restrictive. It's restricted to uh, research in autism spectrum disorder. This one, it allows you to, you, to do the research, but it, only for health-related research, and your findings must be shared broadly. This one is for research into germline determinants of cancer. This one is only to be used for bipolar re disease research, and this one is to be used for software and algorithm development, but not for, um, not for biological research. Now imagine if you're a researcher and you want to combine multiple data sets. How do you intersect all these data, data use restrictions? If you're a DAC, how do you figure out whether the proposed use is, meets what was in the consent? So to disentangle this garbage, the Global Alliance, again, has leapt to our rescue, and its ethics and governance working group has developed something called the Data Use Ontology, or DUO, which can be applied both to patient consents 
and to data, data usage agreements and access requests. Uh, and they do this by creating a, uh, a very detailed ontology of what the, data is, uh, what the data is to be used for, who can use it, and how it can be used, both for, and there's an, one ontology on the data accessibility, and another one for, um, uh, for data requests. And then a matching algorithm can intercede and, uh, and indicate whether the machine-readable proposal for the use of the data matches the machine-readable uh, data use restrictions. Here's an example of how that works. Uh, here's a little snapshot of the ontology. It's, it's much bigger than that. It's stored in standard OBO open source bio, uh, uh, bio ontology format. We have uh, studies A to G, and each one has a series of restrictions. This one's for health, medical, or biomedical research. This one's general research use. These ones are disease-specific research. That one's for diabetes, uveal melanoma, and cancer. So research comes along and says, I'd like to study melanoma. Now the matching algorithm says, OK, here is the, the ontology term for, for melanoma. It's a disease-specific research term. It's a, it's a child of cancer. So he can, he can, study mel he can use the, the DS melanoma set. He can use the cancer data sets. He can use the uh, uh, health, medical, biomedical research sets. He can use the general research use set. But he cannot use something that isn't apparent, a diabetes data set. And he can't use something that's more specific, such as the, the uveal melanoma data set. So this has now um, been, um, uh, uh, this, the standard, the, the ontology has now been published. There's an API for the, al for the algorithms, and early algorithms have been developed, matching algorithms have been de developed by the uh, Broad Institute and, uh, um, and other groups, and will be coming soon to a server, to a GitHub site near you. Um, the last idea I just want to talk about is the idea of, um, uh, of a, uh, a passport. And the idea here is that instead of approving individual project access requests by DAX, which is time consuming, we create a class of trusted researchers who have been, have taken, who are identified, who have taken ethics training and whose institutions certify that they know how to use uh, data responsibly, responsibly. And these researchers will be issued a passport, uh, a thing called a passport, which is a token which gives them access to data sets. And then their institutions and various proxies for their institutions can add visas to their passport that will give them access to certain registered access data sets that are, for example, intended for general research use. And then instead of going through a, uh, going through a long review process, a researcher who wants access to a data set simply goes to the DAC and says, here's my passport. I've been trained. I'm a responsible researcher. The DAC adds a visa to their token, and they can then go to a cloud and get access to the data, greatly simplifying this entire process. And, and finally, making it available for making it easy to combine multiple data sets. This is a concept I strongly support. So to summarize, uh, regional IRBs will accelerate the approval of multi-center studies and make it easier to get studies started. Modular consent forms and use of the data use ontology make it possible to combine data sets for research and take out the guesswork and lengthy review process. The data repository service, another global alliance product, enables the unambiguous identification and retrieval of data sets stored um, around clouds. The overture system, um, for the time being, provides mature data transfer, mirroring, metadata management, and interactive search for cloud-based data sets. And finally, uh, the, the Global Alliance Passport Service removes barriers to using registered access data sets once people start buying into it. So let's all get together and flatten the curve for genomic data sharing. If you're a uh, study designer, 
uh, you should be advocating for central or delegated uh, IRBs with your institution and, and local government. If you, um, uh, you should be, uh, you can already and you should be using the duo in your consents and use the templates when designing consent forms. If you're an implementer of a study and you're executing it, uh, you should really uh, submit to repositories that support the DRS schema or planning to do, to do so. And finally, if you are uh, creating uh, portals to distribute data, you're encouraged to look at Overture, uh, keep your eye on the Global Alliance uh, search space, um, and uh, advocate with your institution and funders for accepting the registered access uh, passport model. I just want to close by uh, uh, providing credit. Um, there are hundreds of people involved in these. These are just a few of the working group leaders. I do want to um, uh, make a call out to um, uh, uh, to uh, uh, Seth Goring at Forbes Wild Foods, who makes really great maple syrup, and uh, to all the uh, members of the Global Alliance here, um, and the Overture teams who have uh, devoted uh, their and volunteered their time to making the world a better place. So thank you. Uh, thank you all. I'm going to stop sharing and say hello to everybody. Thanks so much, Lincoln. That was very interesting and timely. And we have a number of questions. Um, if you want to open your Q&A panel, you can see them. But I'm going to read out the yep. most popular ones until we run out of time. Um, so one question was, do you think that the current COVID-19 situation is changing the way ethics boards are going to review and approve such projects in the future? Well, I think there's okay. I think there's been a uh, um, there's certainly in the during the this emergency period there's been a great acceleration of of, of approval. Um, in in some cases, uh, it, it it appears that the, the process has been short circuited, and that um, uh, portals and projects are going up without that without that approval. I, I think that's a mistake, uh, and that. The, uh, and, and that instead there should be work to bring the committees into the process uh, and just speed up, speed up how, they, how they're able to, to do so. Providing full-time funded staff, of course, would be one way of making IRB re, uh, review go, go a lot faster. Right now, I think the big bottleneck is that they only meet once a month. It's something like the, sitting on the admissions committee for your university. It's not really is not acceptable in a, in a time of rapidly evo of a rapidly evolving problem. Thanks. Um, okay, we someone else asked if you can make your slides available. We can deal with that. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Yeah. How are patient attitudes toward trials different in Canada versus the United States, where our healthcare system is almost entirely profit driven? Emergency room visits can cost thousands. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not a, uh, an expert on this. Anecdotally, there seems to be there's much more con seems to be much more concern in the United States uh, about patients ha uh, who are suspicious of their data being used for profit and and their samples being used for profit, and that emerges as a um, uh, that that emerges as a concern. You don't see that much in, Can in that much in Canada, but. Not, not really the right person to address that. That leads well into the next question, which is uh, during public health crises, it seems like for the good of the community, private health data protections should be suspended. How do you balance that? I do not, I, uh, I, I believe that portions can be, can be suspended, but I believe that wholesale suspension would be a terrible mistake. Uh, and that, uh, you know, it, you know there should be transparency in where a where a outbreak is occurring, how many people are involved, what are the demographics of that group. I don't think that individual people should be ident ever be identified. Uh, I am very concerned about uh, th things that were done in South Korea, for example, where people had cell phone apps that they have to show. To show whether their their COVID status, I don't think that that's necessary for control. But a wholesale suspension, I think, is a is a terrible is a terrible idea, and will ultimately 
lower the public's uh, trust in uh, medical in, in uh, medical re research. We should not do that. Great, thanks. Um, next question is, is the GA4GH working on standard consent and data usage language? Yeah, well, they started out um, with series by creating a series of templates that you with with paragraphs that you could choose from in a Chinese menu fashion to uh, create a, a consent form made of standardized data elements. That's still there, but it's largely been superseded by the ontology, the data use ontology. And I, I was thinking about this this morning. And I realized that I don't think that there's anybody who's working on a um, on an application that'll take a data use ontology description of, uh, of the restrictions and turn that into a human readable consent or vice versa. And so if somebody wants to work on that, I think that that would be a, or, or if you know that someone's working on it, it's not needed, you know, I, I, please share that and share it on the chat. Great, yeah, thanks. Uh, let's see, is there any manual review or standardization of metadata added to song. SRA gets very complicated when people put genotype in one of four to five different fields. Is this mitigated yeah. in song somehow? Great question. Song, song uses actually the JSON schema to describe, to describe its, its schemas. It has extensive validation of both of the schema itself and of the data that's coming in, as well as the ability to add additional rules uh, to the data set. So it, it really is designed to make sure that, that the submitted data is complete and consistently used. I'm sure there are ways to get around it, um, but uh, it is much better than, say, a, a spreadsheet with human readable fields. OK, I think we have time for one more question before the break. Will Overture support local object data store on, for example, OpenStack, Swift, or Ceph Rados? Oh, it, it does already. Okay. It, it, support, it supports storage and a variety of storage storage systems, and uh, Ceph and Swift are are, are among the first. Uh, and it it actually and it uses Elasticsearch for its in, for its indexing and search uh, by default. It supports other search systems, search and indexing systems as well. Thanks so much, Lincoln. Um, we are out of time, but thanks again for such an interesting and timely talk. And I know the whole audience is joining me in virtual applause for you. My pleasure. And thank you very much for the honor uh, of inviting me again. To speak. Thanks so much. And everyone, we will now have a 15 minute break. When I end the present mode, everyone will find themselves back at their table. Um, feel free to chat and mingle. And then the Galaxy and Bosque sessions will be starting in 15 minutes. So you will remember to use the green and blue buttons to get to those other buildings. There won't be anything happening in this main building, uh, although, of course, you can stay and chat like you would in a lobby at a real conference. Thanks again. And everyone, we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.